Blog Talk Radio. Whoever has this knowledge is a being from on high, and when he is called, he hears and answers and turns towards him who calls him and reascends to him. He knows what he is called. He knows when he has come and where he is going. He has turned many from error and preceded them to the places which belong to them, but from which they have strayed. Joy to the man who has rediscovered himself and has awakened and helped others to wake up. The gospel of truth. And of course that, you know, applies to uh, women as well, uh, that wisdom and knowledge is not privy to one gender only and uh you know i, I know that there's um 
a lot of people that adhere to um, women not being allowed to teach in church or be authorities for the word and I don't I don't understand all that um, because like I said wisdom is not something that is privy to gender and that like even my friend and, and the only reason I say this because I've run into this uh, many times um, from a lot of people but anyways one of my friends Dr. Joy um, she was criticizing this way because you know she's a woman but she's also uh, very knowledgeable and very wise and her discernment and she's blessed others by sharing her knowledge and her teaching and so I don't consider that as uh, sinful in nature I don't believe um, but some do and and I'm just grateful that you know she does uh, share her knowledge and that others share her knowledge and I would I would um I would ask all people everywhere to aspire to seek the truth and to come to discernment for yourself and not to rely on others for discernment not to lie on um people that are considered authorities in in the word or in interpretation of the word or you know that have many degrees or many years of study that have been the heads of church or the heads of seminaries or uh, taught in colleges and educational systems or taught Sunday school for many years. I mean, so many people are placed in the positions of power where they influence other people's relationship with not only the Father and the Son, but also the Word and Truth. And, again, this is my opinion. Uh, I don't believe, really, that a lot of people have any kind of discernment on on truth. In, in fact, most people are oblivious to it and care nothing about it. And I would say that, you know, that's the state of the of the of the world is that we are more um, more focused on distractions and entertainment and uh, pursuit of whatever it is that keeps us away from study of self and knowledge of who we are and why we're here what all this is about the exact same thing that the gospel of truth made mention of. And those questions are so very important. Again, in my opinion, to people and our reasons for being here and what all of this is about. And I, I've seen, um, I've seen a resurgence of interest from people from all walks of life to study about pre-existence, about incarnation, about reincarnation, about the three world ages and how they affect and play out on all of our lives and how all that also ties in, fits, and explains the legacy of why Christ had to come into the flesh and also why he was the first resurrected. He was the first to be resurrected. Before him, um, humanity sat in shield. And so these, these stories are important to understand too because if you know about Christ and why it is he had to come into the flesh and also about his pre-existence and how he was with the Father. And we're going to cover some of these issues today. Because this remembrance, this acknowledgement, this recognition of who our 
king, who our king is, who our savior is, who our, who the only begotten son is, and why it was that he had to fulfill role and complete mission in such way that we now find ourselves with chance for redemption and a chance to be redeemed from our second estate and our attempts uh, to live through the second world age and uh, to aspire to the salvation that is promised to those that can remain and serve in righteousness and fulfill the desires and the wishes of the Father and the Son for um, our lives while we're here in the flesh serving out Not only, I, you know, I don't want to say sentence or even though it's true that this is, you know, this is part of a prison planet system and that we are caught up in the flesh and that, uh, and that, you know, there there's stuff that we must do to fulfill our missions and our spiritual um, destinies. And yet, most of us are still lost in forgetfulness and have no idea and and really don't care uh, about the higher things of life and and our spiritual um, reasons for being here. And so we're going to talk about some of those things through some of the quotes and scriptures that I'm going to bring out. Some of these are from books you've read and know about and may not have interpreted this way, and, and some of these are going to be fresh and new. And so you might want to get a pen because we're going to cover a lot. And like I said, this will bring to light so much of really are the larger questions of who we are while we're here and what this is all about. And for those, because a lot of people come to this show with um, no Christian leanings or no desire to understand or want to know uh, the Lord or the Word, but they are interested in uh, pre-Adamic history or the fallen angels or the Nephilim or the giants or whatever it is, the New World Order, we cover so many things here. However it is that you have been brought to this show, the real, real reason for um, for all of us being together in fellowship now in this strange time, in this strange place, is to know this that I'm about to go into. Because in my opinion, this is this is the secret that ties it all together. Um, and so I appreciate all of you joining me today and we're going to start with a little known quote from the wisdom of Jesus son of Sirach which is part of the apocryphal book and again uh, oh also I want to make mention of this I decided that with my next book not the sons of God after that one Sons of God, Who We Are, Why We're Here, that one's going to be out in November. The next book I'm going to be, well, which I'm already working on, had a focus on the prior times to Atlantis, to the fallen angels, to the Elohim and the um, the lives that the angels lived on this planet in this solar system prior to the creation of Sixth Day. Uh, spirit breath filled Adam and Eve or modern humanity also called civilized man that that was going to be the prevailing focus and theme for that book but I've decided to add a partial focus on pre-existence and tie them together of our first world age lives the pre-existence and how it links up and ties to the prior times, and how it was that that first world age 
um, led to where we are now in the flesh because we lost our first estate and we are now in the second world age in what is the second estate. Our flesh bodies are really the second estate and our chance to again redeem ourselves to the righteousness and the salvation that the Lord has promised to the elect. And I'm also going to show you today how the elect and those that serve him and um, and know him that and I pray that you know myself to be included and counted among uh, those that serve the Father, but we've been with him for uh, since even before the beginning, since before the foundations of the world. And so it says this. So the creator of all things gave me a commandment, and he that made me caused my tabernacle to rest and said, Let thy dwelling be in Jacob and thine inheritance in Israel. He created me from the beginning before the world, and I shall never fail. In the holy tabernacle I served before him, and so was I established in Zion. Again, that's the wisdom of Jesus, son of Sirach. And that's... um, Verse 8 through 10. Now, many of you know about, have read about, and and now come to discernment and understanding on Psalm 82, which is a very, in my mind, uh, a very important quotation to help us to understand, because it's also from the accepted canon, from the Old and the New Testament, uh, the passages that are from the Old and the New Testament are so very important because they force people to look into the apocryphal and the pseudepigraphal, uh, the codices, the Dead Sea Scrolls, into those books um, seeking out these jewels, trying to locate and find these um, scriptures that are just loaded with truth and discernment and this is you know truth that goes against what are the accepted well maybe not against but um, it, this is not the the mainstream churchianity belief system most people and like I said I've done many interviews with I, who people I consider to be the most research and well-respected individuals as far as um, theology and the study of the word and yet they have no opinions on this other than no you know we we didn't pre-exist and so that's why I decided to bring a bit of focus on this theme and to do the many shows that we've been doing uh, John and I Uh, and others on this particular topic. And there seems to be a lot of interest on it. Um, But And so that's why I wanted to do today's show, too, to bring out things that people haven't heard about. So we're going to read Psalm 82, give a short description explanation, and then go into something else that seems to tie into what is being spoken about in this particular passage. Psalm 82, verse 1 through 8. God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth judgeth among the gods. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked, Selah? Defend the poor and the fatherless. Do injustice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hands of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. All right, important. 
God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. We're speaking about Yahweh Elohim, the Most High, and also Yahushua, Savior, Messiah, the Word, the Only Begotten, who is the visual embodiment of the unseen and invisible Father. And so them together created all things and brought all things into into being. And so here it says that they are those that judge among the gods. And when we're talking about the gods here, we're not talking about any other creators because Yahushua and the Father, they created, manifested all things. They're the only ones that have such ability to form and manifest, to create out of nothingness. The Elohim and the gods, uh, which are the other angels, the sons of God that are uh, part of the family of God, the, that are the created of God, they are um, servants. But they are not creators unless they are aligned to and doing the bidding and the will of the Father and the Son. And then they have capacity to allow Christ to work through them. And then when that happens, all miracles and all things to manifest them. But here the Lord is saying that he judges among the gods. And so it also says, have I not said ye are God, meaning us, the, the children of humanity that now find us in flesh form, and shall ye are God, all of you are children of the Most High, we are all sons of God, but ye shall die like men. We're going to die like men because that's what we are. We're fallen angels now encased in the flesh. We're still spiritual beings, but we're going to die uh, the flesh of the body, and we're going to experience that, the, the death of the flesh, of our soul encasement. And it says, furthermore, and fall like one of the princes. Who is that prince? That prince is Lucifer, who was also one of the created angels, but he fell and was cast out, and he now is inhabiting the form of a man, and he will die in the shape of a man in the sight of kings and queens who are the progeny of his seed. This is spoken about in Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah chapter 14, with both give mention of the Lord warring against his children and his seed line and how he will not allow them to inherit uh, cities and to build cultures. And so this particular psalm speaks of us as the sons of God, now having also lost our first estate, incarnating into the flesh. And I'm not saying that just because we are in a fallen state and that we are all in flesh form now, that we were part of the rebellion in certain capacity or that we were on the side of evil or that we were the usurpers of uh, and those that were led astray. Because the Lord says that even the elect would incarnate into the flesh during this time and that they too would take on embodiment to serve out the Lord's purposes, the King's purposes, the Father's purposes on this planet and in this time. And that even like Jeremiah and Moses and uh, all the, the patriarchs, the prophets of old, how it speaks about in the Word that they were selected even before the world was made and even before the foundation of the world. Jeremiah when it talks about that, how I ordained you to be a prophet unto the nation before you were ever even in the womb. So we're going to continue on with this theme and explain this because this passage is also tied to um, what I just read. 
This is John chapter 17. Let me check the chat room because I know there's a lot, a lot of questions going on, and I appreciate appreciate all of you. All right. John chapter 17. We're going to start from verse 1. We're going to read through this whole, uh, not, well, pretty much the whole chapter because there's several references, and I will stop to highlight individual passages um, so that we can explain this theme and bring it out in all these various passages. Verse 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. This is an important verse. Verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee, before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. I want to stop here. All right, focus on verse 5 and 6. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So, Yahushua is saying here in this particular passage, as it says in John chapter 1, that he was with the Father, that the Father knew him, and that gave him his glory. And that this all happened before even the world was. That we're talking about the creation of modern earth, uh, the dividing of the firmament, the destruction of Tiamat, all those things uh, which happened after. And I talk about that also in my next book when I explain the Genesis timeline. Uh, But I'm not going to go there today. If you want to look at it, there's a... Timeline of creation in the archives where I explain all that. All right. Verse 6. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. And so the Father gave to the Son these particular spirits to manifest his glory. And then it says this. Thine they were, meaning they were the fathers, they were with the Father, and thou gavest them me. So the Father is given these spirits, the elect, to his Son to utilize for their glory. And then it says, and they have kept thy word. So these are the ones that were serving the Father during the first world age, during our first estate, and they were the ones that served him and held up his commandments and ordinances. They were the ones that fought with Michael and the cherubim angels to eradicate Lucifer and his evil angels from the heavens. Because all this took place before we ever entered into the flesh and before Adam and Eve were ever created, before the second world was even thought up to breed. Well, the Lord already knew. The Father and the Son already knew. But as far as manifesting this um, this idea and this uh, unfolding the the whole plan of salvation as the Father and Son did, the angels didn't know about that. We didn't know about that. 
All right, so I'm going to continue on with verse 7 because we're going to get into another important theme here. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all are mine, are thine. And thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I am come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. All right, let's review verse 12. Now remember going back to Psalm 82 where it spoke of the the prince that would have to die. That prince is the son of perdition. It says in this particular passage, verse 12, Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. And so Satan, his fall and his resurrect, I mean his uh, rebellion and insurrection is a necessary evil for what would be the fulfillment of Scripture. All right. Now, I'm going to go ahead and skip down to another particular passage, but please do read verse 13 through 23, which continue as far as the thing of the Father and the Son are one. Because it's important to understand this, to know about the pre-existence of Christ and how he was with the Father. That way you don't, you know, have it somewhere in your head that Yahushua was just some other man or some other fulfillment or embodiment of a, of an avatar or ascended master or anything like that. Christ pre-existed with the Father. And he is the only begotten of the Father. He is the Word. He's the one whom the Father utilized to bring forth all of creation and to manifest all of creation. Completely different thing. All right, verse 24 says this. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. And so again, here's the whole reoccurring theme, that the elect were with Christ, and Christ was with the Father, uh, and that all had preexisted even before the foundation of the modern world. All right. Now, just to just to um, give a little bit more information on to the whole theme of Christ's preexistence, because it's very important for you to understand this and to to know this, to know your Lord, to know who the Son of God is, and to also to know the Father in such capacity because when you know Christ, you know the Father. They are together one, as we just read in all of those preceding passages. So, this particular passage comes from the Gospel of Bartholomew and it's, it's 
spoken by Satan. And Satan gives a description of how he was the first archangel created. And he's going to talk about what happened before the war in heaven when all things were not yet uh, destroyed, not yet uh, not good, you know. All right, so says this, and this is important. And he lightened him and saith to him, Say all that thou hast done and all that thou doest. And Beliar answered and said, If thou wilt know my name, at the first I was called Satan now, which is interpreted a messenger of God. But when I rejected the image of God, my name was called Satanas, that is, an angel that keepeth hell. And again Bartholomew saith unto him, Reveal unto me all things, and hide nothing from me. He said unto him, I swear unto thee by the power of the glory of God, that even if I would hide, ought I cannot, for he is near that would convict me. For if I were able, I would have destroyed you like one of them that were before you. For indeed, I was formed the first angel for when god made the heavens he took a handful of fire and formed me first michael second for he had his son before the heavens and the earth and we were formed for when he took thought to create all things his son spake a word so that we also were created by the will of the Son and the consent of the Father. Very important verse here. What Satan is saying in this particular passage, he says that they were formed, he was the first angel, the first angel created in heaven. He took uh, it says that Michael was the second angel. But what is important is that Satan says that the sun was before the heavens and the earth were formed. And that it was the sun who took a thought to create all things and spake a word because it says that Christ sung the universe into creation, that through different vibrations and through vocalization or certain uh, wavelengths and vibrations and energy that the creation was brought into being. And really, that's what all things are, is energy and vibration, a wavelength, a certain density but in its purest form, it's the energy that is the vocalization of what is the word. All things are Christ and made form and of him. So continuing, it says, so that we also were created, we also were created by the will of the Son and the consent of the Father. He formed, I say, first me, next Michael, the chief captain of the host that are above, Gabriel third, Uriel fourth, Raphael fifth, Nathanael sixth, and other angels of whom I cannot tell the names. And again, that's the Gospel of Bartholomew that's Satan speaking about what he remembers of the early creation. This is uh, uh, before the separation of light and darkness. Because they were cast out on the second day. All right. Another thing of interest. 
this is um this will show you how the spirits recognize him as Lord and they also know what is coming, that judgment is coming, that they only have short time, that they are going to be eradicated from existence, that they will be uh, dissolved as if they had never been. It will be as if they had never been born, is what the word says. And it would be better for them to never have been born. Um, All right, this is from Matthew chapter 8. It says this. And when he was come to the other side into the country of Gergensenes, there met him two possessed with devils, coming out of the tombs exceedingly fierce, so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God, thou Son of God? Art thou come hither? to torment us before the time. And there was a good way off from them, a herd of many swine feeding. So the devils besought him, saying, If thou cast us out, suffer us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. And when they were come out, they went into the herd of swine, and behold, the whole herd of swine ran violently down a steep place into the sea, and perished in the waters. Uh, This particular story is giving you illustration of how these devils, these demons, how they were in possession of these two men, and how they were living near these tombs, and that they were attacking all those that came by the way. So they were haunting these particular places. We'll notice that they cry out and say, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? So they have recognition of him as being the Savior and also being the Son of God. And they know that he has power to cast them out and to torment them if he so desire. It says, and thou come hither to torment us before the time. And so the Lord sends them into the swine who then jump off of the cliff to kill themselves. This would be a good place for me to also talk a little bit about the theme of reincarnation. Uh, Because a lot of people, especially from the New Age, that come from that perspective, they believe that we cycle through life and being and that we incarnate more than once over and over and over through time and space. Um, I'm going to tell you that that's not true. Now, there is certain truth to it, and this is what I have to explain, because for the elitists, the occultists of the world, the blood royal elite, those that rule through the divine right of kings, there is possibility of reincarnation only to the extent that it is certain uh, those that are called the ancient ones, those that are of... um, the first rebellion, that these beings do inhabit and cycle through life and being, taking form and holding uh, 
existence through those that willingly give themselves through ritual, blood sacrifice, sexual magic, and other such abominations to being a host for this particular ancient um, presence. And so, yes, for them, because they're trying to escape judgment. Remember, the, the, um, the fallen ones, they're trying to escape judgment. They know that their time is coming, that they're going to be eradicated completely from existence. But the only way for them to hold form is through such ritual. And that it takes blood ritual and it takes individuals being willing recipients, willing fit extensions for those that want to inhabit them and occupy them. And so those that do go to such extent that are willing to give on themselves and to be involved in a cult in such way, they are the ones that, yeah, they, they are hosted by this ancient evil presence. And they have been certain bloodlines, certain bloodlines, are inhabited and hosted by these ancient beings. And so that's the difference between incarnation and reincarnation. For for souls that are incarnating into the flesh and coming into the second world age and, and second world age and visiting this experience is our second estate. You're going to live once, you're going to die, you're going to be judged. So realize that every thought, every action, everything you do while you're here is very important and has specific bearing on your election, which that's a theme I'll go into very soon. But not only to your election, but to your salvation and where your soul, your spirit will be for eternity. Or what will be the eternal third world age, which is coming. Which is a return to our first estate. Or at least that's what I pray for all of us. But it says that there won't be a lot. Because not many care. Not many want to know. And so just to give you a little um, a little something from the ancient text to, that speaks about this, from the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, tablet number eight, uh, let me find the particular passage, but There's a couple in here. It says right here. Far in the past, before Atlantis existed, men there were who delved into darkness using dark magic, calling up beings from the great deep below us. And forth came they into this cycle. Formless were they of another vibration, existing unseen by the children of earth men. Only through blood could they have formed being. Only through man could they live in the world. In ages past were they conquered by the masters driven below to places whence they came. But some there were who remained hidden in spaces and plains unknown to man. Lived they in Atlantis as shadows. But at times they appeared among men. A, when the blood was offered, forth they came to dwell among men. In the form of man they amongst us, but only to sight were they as our men. 
serpent headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men, crept they into the councils, taking forms that were like unto men, and slaying by their art the chief of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling over man. Only by magic could they be discovered. Only by sound could their faces be seen. Sought they from the kingdom of shadows to destroy man and to rule in his place. And so here you have exactly what I've been telling you about. And this is an ancient reference. One final passage, because this talks about how they're going to make their appearance again. It says this. Yet beware, the serpent still liveth in a place that is open at times to the world. Unseen they walk among thee in places where the rites have been said. Again, as time passes onward, shall they take the semblance of men. So here the ancient Nakash, the interdimensional shape-shifting reptilian being that we've been talking about, They've been ruling over humanity, through humanity, inhabiting the form and taking over uh, the, those that are the, the councils of humanity, the kings and queens. And here, unseen, they walk among the in places where the rights have been said. Those rights are being said in places like Bohemia Grove, in places like castles and uh, these European cathedrals all across uh, these old Gothic worlds where for hundreds of years blood has been spilt and sacrifice has been made to assist these individuals in holding form and in ruling over men, as it says. Crept they into the councils taking forms that were like unto men, slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, and taking their form, they rule over man. And it says, again, sought they from the kingdom of shadows to destroy man and to rule in his place. So that is the whole theme of reincarnation. That's the whole thing that Lucifer will promise to the elitist. He will promise to uh, the Masons and to the Shriners and to all those that will bow down to him, that will accept him as God. He will promise them kingdoms and he will promise them uh, glory. He'll promise them 70 virgins. He'll promise them uh, uh, immortality, everlasting life, escape from judgment. He'll promise them that they can be like ancient aliens or gods as themselves and and that they've got nothing to worry about, that there is no Christ, there is no judgment, there is no creator, there is no father of creation, There's uh, that Christianity, everything is just made up, the Ancient aliens made it up themselves, or that Christ is one of the ancient aliens, or that he's one of the uh, ascended masters, or one of these fallen beings. And so, that's why it's important for you to have recognition of who you are, and why the Lord wanted you to wake up to this information, to come to discernment on these things. Because we are battling a very wicked and evil present. The power of the principalities and rulers of darkness of this world. Read in fullness the Emerald Tablets of Thoth. It will take you one afternoon. Sit down and read all 15 tablets. They're mind-blowing in that they give you insight into what is a forgotten world, an ancient legacy that has been forbidden, 
eradicated, stripped away, uh, and held as privileged and, and secretive and knowledge only for the elites of the world. And so reclaim your power. Reclaim your authority as a son of God, as a child of Christ, to know the most ancient of secrets, to know the most ancient of knowledge and wisdom, things that have complete importance, that have every bearing on who you are and what you need to be doing, what you need to be getting busy on. So we're going to continue on because I've got so much more lined up that I'm not going to be able to get to. But All right. This is a passage that Solomon wrote um, from Proverbs chapter 8. It says this. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the field, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the faces of the depth. When he established the clouds above. When he strengthened the fountains of the deep. When he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment. When he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of this earth, and my delight were with the sons of men. So, This particular passage from Proverbs chapter 8. Let's look at it closely. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. Solomon says, I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning or ever the earth was. So this again goes back to before the formation of the earth, before the uh, second world age, before the creation of Adam and Eve before even the earth was destroyed and resettled. Because all that was talked about also in Genesis. I speak about that. That destruction of the earth was the splitting of Tiamat. It was the creation of what was the asteroid belt. It was the destruction of that planet that used to be there where the asteroid belt is. So, and then this 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 particular chapter is so loaded, so important. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When, listen to this, this is important, when he prepared the heavens, So Solomon is saying is that before the earth was made, while the heavens were still being prepared, while things were still unfolding within the heavens, he was there. I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, he was there. So when the waters were being divided and the firmness were being split up, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, 
All this is talking about the destruction of Tiamat, which is described in the Enuma Elish. And so Solomon is talking about being with the Lord as one of the first world age spirits and being witness to that destruction that later became what was the new earth or what the Sumerians called Ki. And this event was witnessed by all the sons of the morning and it was uh, it was celebrated and historically historically immortalized by all of the early creation stories, the epics, the creation epics, Akkadian, Babylonian. Those are those passages and those verses, those stories are talking about the early creation of our solar system and the early uh, settling of what became the orbits that the planets now hold uh, and the creation of what was then the procession of the equinoxes and the whole 25,000, 26,000, almost 26,000 year cycle of movement through the 12 houses of the Zodiac. And that's also what began what was then the accounting of time, the, what be, you know, began the, uh, the study of the heavens by the fallen angel. That's also when astrology came into being, you know, and all those sciences based on the heavens. Because this is when the the astrological cycle that you know the twelve houses and our movement through them was created. That's what the Enuma Elish is celebrating. So it's important for you to understand that as well. All these things are covered in my next book. All right, check the chat room, then we'll continue on. We're quickly running out of time. I'll pray for you, Papa Bear, that your family wakes up to the strange nature of the reality that we're dealing with. That's one of the hardest things for people and, and especially for family members is is to once you know truth and are aware of the strange nature of it, it's hard to accept it. It's hard to unlearn all of the things that we consider to be reality, all the things that we have come into agreement with so many others on as to what is the fundamental nature of what is real for people in this world, uh, our children and ourselves. And so, um, excuse me while I take support. All right. Let me continue here. Um, Just a real quick passage from the Apocryphon of James. So, one sentence. It says this. They will ask you, where are you going? The answer, to the place from which I came. I return to that place. So, you know, most people believe that our existence begins with conception, with being formed into the flesh that our spirit enters into our flesh bodies at this particular time. And this is where we are then we are created. That our spiritual existence had no uh, prior anything up until this point. And that we somehow are then just created out of nothingness is that moment to then just come and inhabit these forms of flesh. 
Now I understand a lot of people, you know, believe that, and 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 that's what we've basically been taught. You know that life is just all random chaos, is meaningless, and that we come into these flesh bodies not out of any divine plan or or need to fulfill certain goal uh, and aspire to certain destiny, but just to live and work and and eat and sleep and dream and to, you know, bear offspring and to uh, leave a name and try to accumulate as much wealth as we can and, and leave as an inheritance to our progeny and to our seed and that nothing else really even matters. And, um, and for a lot of people that, that explanation is sufficient, is enough. And they don't need to go any further. They don't need to have any uh, great desire for answers. That's enough. That's enough. That explains enough, and they're fulfilled with it, even though it doesn't, you know, guarantee or or explain, you know, afterlife or eternity or anything before or anything after uh, and so for a, a lot of people, they'll never go and start looking into these things for themselves. But for those that want to know answers, that want to know why things say what they say, here's another passage that talks about the princes. First Corinthians, verse 6. Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. You know, here it equates the princes again, uh, in this case, to the Pharisees that uh, killed our Lord. But we are those that fall, fell into the flesh. And then here again it says, which God ordained before the world unto our glory. Now I'm going to try to move a little bit quicker here because there's so many passages I want to give to you, share with you that um, you need to go and study for yourself. Now, as far as election, people ask me and ask others why it is that certain people are born into their lives uh, and and have just really what we consider a raw deal as far as coming into life and being, why certain people would choose to incarnate into certain conditions, certain circumstance, certain situations, and why the Lord would allow them to inhabit such circumstances. Well, the whole thing stems from election. And election has everything to do with what we had done previously as our first world age, spiritual lives, and as those spiritual beings. Whatever it is that we did during that time, it led us to be in the flesh now. And again, I don't equate this as just only being a curse. This is also a privilege. Incarnating into the flesh and living through the flesh, and that not only is it a curse because we're in a fallen state, but it is also a privilege in that we have chance to glorify the Father and the Son by fulfilling and living up to um, our election. And so I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to read this quickly. This will explain election and will also help you to understand why people are in the lives that they are, why certain children, you know, it explains all that. Verse 7, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall they 
thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. For this is the, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of work, but of him that calleth. It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? Why? Hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So this particular passage, this is Romans chapter 9, and it's verse, I just read 7 through 20. Three, I believe it was. This passage talks about even the seed of I, um, Jacob and Esau, and how Esau was hated, and that they were Esau was hated before he was even born, even as a young innocent babe, as a child. And why would that be? Unless, of course, the Lord, the Father had just cause and reason. Because our God is just. He is a righteous God. He is a just, compassionate God. He forgives us and gives us every benefit of doubt, gives us every chance to repent. And yet Esau, he hated. And the reason being is because Esau was an usurper. He was a rebeller. He was one of those that joined in the rebellion of Satan and the fallen angels. And he was one of those that served the dark side and the evil which caused humanity to fall, which caused us even being in the flesh now. So he was on that side. He was part of the sons of Belial. And he even gave up his birthright in the flesh. He went out seeking darkness and married into the pagan tribes. And so that's why the Lord hated him. And so it's important for you to understand election because election has everything to do with why we are where we are now in the flesh. 
and in whatever circumstances and situation we find ourselves in. One Another passage which talks about Jacob and Esau. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, and I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, we are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall build, but I will throw down. They shall call them the brother of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. We're talking about the children of Esau, the Canaanites those that are not written into the book of life. All right. Continuing. Oh, this is another passage, too, which talks about these two different bloodlines and also speaks on the foundations of the world. So I'm going to read this real quick as well. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me. Because my word hath no place in you, I speak that which I have seen with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. And Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. You, why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Whence he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not? Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, Say we not well that thou art a Samaritan and hast a devil? Jesus answered, I have not a devil, but I honor my father, and you do dishonor me. And I seek not my own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth verily. Verily I say unto you, if a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. Then said the Jews unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets, and thou sayest, If a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham, which is dead? And the prophets are dead, who makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not know him, but I know him. And if I should say, I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, 
Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 8. Before Abraham was, I am. In this particular passage, he convicts the Pharisees of being, literally, the children of the devil, of being of that seed line, and of hating him because they are not of Abraham's seed. And then, speaking of Abraham, he says, before Abraham was I am. Now, that's very, very important because what the Lord is saying in this particular passage is he's saying is that he was before Abraham. He preexisted before Abraham, before Abraham was even conceived and thought to be brought up into the womb, Christ already was. And to give you a little bit more as to, because uh, I know I'm running out of time. I only got a little bit of time, so I want to get a couple more passages to give to you that verifies this. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now, this one is one that most people have never heard about. This is from the Assumption of Moses. Very important passage here. He spoke in the tabernacle to give it by Joshua, saying to Joshua these words, Be strong and of a good courage, so as to do with thy might all that has been commanded that you may be blameless unto God, so says the Lord of the world. For as he has created the world on behalf of his people, but he was not pleased to manifest this purpose of creation from the foundation of the world, in order that the Gentiles might thereby be convicted, yea, to their own humiliation by their argument, convict one another accordingly he designed and devised me and he prepared me before the foundation of the world that I should be the mediator of his covenant and now I declare unto you that the time of the years of my life is fulfilled and I am passing away to sleep with my fathers even in the presence of all the people. This is Moses. And he's speaking to Joshua. And he talk, He says to him. Um, accordingly he designed and devised me. And he prepared me before the foundation of the world. That I should be the mediator of his covenant. Is that not exactly what Jeremiah said? Before I formed thee in the belly I knew thee. It's the exact same thing. The Lord knew us. The elect preexisted with him. Now, I think I've got enough for one more passage. And I think this will summarize and tie together a lot for you. Let's see if I can find it real quick. Here we go. This is it. Ephesians. Says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, accordingly as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Skipping, because I'm running out of time. Skipping down to verse 11. Actually, I'll skip to verse 9. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, 
that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. And I think I want to end it with that. I'm going to take a look in the chat room and I want to just thank everybody. Thank all of you for sharing. I'm sorry I didn't could not keep up with all of what was being typed. Uh, I hope I didn't miss any questions. But And I hope that this uh, this show was beneficial to you. Chrissy says thank you, Sam, and thank you, Chrissy, for joining us and for all the uh, other listeners um, that have been supporting us for a long time. We appreciate you so very much, and for sharing our work with others. I think a lot of people are waking up to the truth of the things that uh, we're coming to the sermon on. So, God bless all. Good night. We'll talk to you soon.
Of the reason. 